want you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 17 through 18. I'm going to speak to you for just a few moments. Came across two unnamed brothers this week. And they were uh, talking about how they were getting ready for uh, Pastor Chris's Easter extravagan extravaganza yesterday. We had a massive Easter egg hunt on the church property. And uh, the mother asked these two unnamed brothers to go ahead and boil some eggs and get them ready. And so they were preparing, put eggs out in the counter, and the younger brother got a big idea. And he said to his older brother, he said, if you'll just allow me to smash three of these eggs over your head, he said, I'll give you 10 bucks. And the older brother began to contemplate it, consider it, and finally he said, okay, it's worth it. So the younger brother took, his, took the first egg and smashed it over his head. Yoke is running down his cheek and uh, looks at him and grins, reaches over and grabs the second egg and smashes it on top of his head. And now it's running down both cheeks and down his shirt, reaches over and grabs the third egg. He stands there and looks at him, He's smiling and grinning, and his older brother said, go ahead. The younger brother said, why would I do that? I'd have to give you 10 bucks. <laughs> Man, that's rough, isn't it? That's really rough. <laughs> oh, Lord, help us. Have you ever uh, had an experience where at first glance you judge someone quickly? You kind of sized them up. And then after getting to know them, you, you step back and said, my goodness, uh, they're not what I thought they were. And suddenly there was a sense of appreciation for them. I'd like to say to you that I think that's the way a lot of people deal with a the cross. They glance at it. They look at it. They really don't understand it. But after they begin to look at it through the lens of resurrection, through the lens of resurrection, suddenly it comes alive and it has meaning that they never understood. I want to talk about this scripture and uh, about this whole idea of on Resurrection Sunday, oh, the cross looks different. I said on Resurrection Sunday, the cross looks different. Would you read this out loud with me, beginning with verses 17 and 18? It's on the screen. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach, tell the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Lord, make it easy in these next few moments to deliver and speak your word in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. You may be seated. The Apostle Paul calls the cross foolishness to those who are perishing. They are not looking at the cross through the lens of resurrection. They haven't experienced it. They don't understand it. And so it seems as if it's complete foolishness. I think to get a handle on this, we have to understand the culture of our Lord's day and perhaps why they struggled with accepting this to be anything more than foolishness. Um, I think people today struggle with this issue for some of the very same reasons. For the believer in the cross, one finds revelation. If you only see weaknesses and human frailty, you better look again. You better look again. The mystery has been revealed to the believer. That's why when you enter into a room on Resurrection Sunday with a bunch of believers there is energy and passion because we are looking at the cross through a resurrected Savior. Does that make any sense? Well, let's give him the biggest praise of the day that he has got up from the grave. It's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing. The mystery has been revealed to the believer, and because of resurrection from the dead, we look at the cross so differently. Let's, let's look an attempt to look through the unbeliever's lens, and may, maybe we can start in our Lord's day. 
We know that there was a group of people that lived in that day called the Romans. They were an empire. They were, uh, they had rule. They were an authority over the Lord's land of that day. And to the Roman who was inclined to see authority and leadership as power, they had to ask the question, what king would allow himself to die this kind of death? No king who was in control. No king who had control. No king who was in authority would ever, ever allow himself to be displayed on a cross in this manner and to die. It looked as if it was the ultimate picture of weakness. He died as a common criminal. In fact, it was the Roman courts that designed the cross. It was the Roman courts who used it as judgment. They could not possibly understand. The cross was designated for the lowest of low. The Roman didn't, Romans didn't get it. The Greek lens, the Greeks of that day, who were inclined to emphasize the perfection of the body. What king would die this way? Our Olympics that we celebrate today find their origin in Greek culture. And it started as if it was an effort to perfect the body, to make the body perfect, to work the body, to get more out of the body, and to shoot for perfection with the body. What king could possibly allow his body to be so abused and beaten on an old rugged cross? To the Greek, it seemed as if it was absolute foolishness and it was grotesque. Then there was the Jewish lens of that day. Who were, they were looking for a king to return like David, one who would bring the nation back and provide economic power and provide prominence and provide all that it needed. Its military would be strong again. King, you say, it's a laughable joke. And to the world of that day, the cross was meaningless. We know just like today, People are blinded today, and when they look at the cross, they see it merely as a holiday that's celebrated once a week. It makes a nice piece of jewelry. They want to identify with Christianity, but they never really see what it's all about, and they certainly don't look through a resurrected lens. To the world, the cross was cruel, and that's what unbelievers see. It's cruelty. How gruesome was the death of Jesus looking through the lens of the world today? I'll tell you, I, we watched the uh, Passion uh, of the Christ again. It's been 13 years. It's hard to believe it's been that long since it came out. And Mel Gibson's movie, and we displayed that and showed that Thursday night. And I found myself feeling some of the same emotions that I felt the first time I watched that. I wanted to stand up and cry, Stop! Stop it! Why isn't anybody throwing themselves out there and doing something to try to stop this? It's going too far. I don't know what you felt. I'm sure there was a whole range of emotions that one feels when they see such a display. But, but it's difficult to watch. And yet, if we don't watch it, if we don't see it, if we don't understand it, we can never measure God's grace. See, to the believer, it's not just an ugly scene. To the believer, we know that in three days, he's going to get up out of the grave. And in three days, it's going to be the greatest display of power that mankind has ever known. He subjected himself to the cross, and that's an amazing thing. Oh, come on, let's give him praise for that. He deserves our praise. Notice how these early, early followers of Christ embraced, and this is the key, they embraced the cruelty of the cross. I'm not sure we embrace it. They embraced the cruelty of the cross and, and the suffering, and rather than judging it as weakness, the early believers embraced it. They were looking through a different lens. Listen to Paul in Philippians 3.10, that I may know him that I may know him in the fellowship of his suffering and in the power of his resurrection. But Paul is praying that I may know him, that I may know him in such a way that I can enter into his sufferings with him. How in the world could he do it? He's doing it because he is embracing the cross. He's embracing suffering. To know him in his suffering gives you and I opportunity to know him in his fullness. One can't know him if they don't identify with his suffering, and his suffering was displayed on the cross. Let me explain this. Look at the cross through a different lens. 
Look at the cross through the lens of, of resurrection. Unless you have suffered from grief, you will never know him as comforter like Mary discovered at the feet and like Mary discovered when she found an empty tomb. You'll never know him as comforter unless you've suffered with grief. Unless you have suffered from bondage. Jesus displayed bondage and captivity. He allowed himself to be taken captive. But if you've never experienced bondage or captivity, you can never know him as deliverer. Am I making any sense? Unless you know him and have suffered from disease or sickness, how can you possibly know him as healer? Unless you have suffered from danger, how can you know him as protector? All of this was displayed on the cross. Unless you have suffered from poverty, how can you know him as provider? Unless you have suffered from loneliness, how can you know him as one who sticks closer than a brother? Unless you have suffered from a broken relationship, how can you know him? How can you know him as one who reconciles? Unless you have suffered from failure, how can you know him as restorer? I'm telling you, we look at the cross. Believers look at at the cross through a very different lens. We see power on display. When he could have called 10,000 angels to take himself down, he subjected himself and chose to die and become the ultimate sacrifice for you and I and our sins. Thanks be unto God. When we look at the cross, we look through the power of resurrection and we see a Jesus who is alive and well and overcame death, hell, and the grave. Yeah, we can praise him for that. Not only should we look through the lens of unbelievers and their worldviews who see cruelty of the cross, at the cross and see absolute foolishness, let us also look through the believer's lens. And that's what I just started doing. It's unbelievably glorious. Glorious, you say. How? How? When we believers look at the cross, instead of saying, oh, how gross. How despicable, how gross. We look at it and say, how glorious. How glorious. The believer sees something very different because he's resurrected. And yes, we remember and see the suffering and shame. But because he lives, we see power and glory on display. Listen, I promise, believers and unbelievers can look at the same cross and see two different things. Glorious or gross, weakness or power, wisdom or foolishness. The question is, what do you see? What do you see when you look through your lens? Are you looking at the cross through the lens of resurrection? What possible glory could be in the cross? What did Paul mean in Galatians 6.14 when he said, but God forbid that I should glory in anything except the cross. I won't glory in nothing, anything, nothing at all. I will glory in the cross because Paul embraced everything that the cross meant and the power that was on display there. He said, I've got it. I will only glory in the cross. If you want to see, if you want to see, change your glasses. It's on display. It's on display. The definition of glory, Paul says, I will glory in the cross. What does he mean? We've talked about this in the last few years at Westmore. When we talk about glory, we sing about it, we talk about it. But here's what it literally means. It literally means the total of God's attributes. You know, God has a lot of attributes. He's Savior. He's Deliverer. He's Healer. He's Comforter. He's helper. He's miracle worker. He sticks closer than a brother. Okay, you can keep going on and on and on. He has a lot of attributes. And you only know him by what he has revealed to you. And here's the deal. He revealed just about every attribute there is to reveal on the cross. You say, wait a minute. He's omnipotent. Power is at the cross. That wasn't weakness. You or I in a heartbeat would have said to hell with everybody that's trying to kill me. I'm off this cross. Am I okay? We would have sent them straight to hell because we'd have had the power to do so. But some of you are quiet right now. 
That's exactly what we would have done. We, we, we would have taken ourselves off that and said, enough is enough. I won't stand for this one more, more minute. I would suggest to you, especially if you can whip a man, it takes a lot more power for you to turn the other cheek than it does to take it. Amen. You tell me which way takes more power. The greatest power that's ever been displayed was on the cross because we see it through the resurrection lens. Um, you want to talk about omnipresence? The Bible says the whole earth shook. Darkness filled the earth. At that moment when he died, when he said, it is finished, the omnipresence was available. Every attribute, just about every attribute that you can think of was displayed on the cross. You need a reconciler? He's hanging there. He had one hand a hold of mankind and another hand a hold of God the Father, and he's basically saying, I'll be your bridge. I'll get you to the Father. No man comes to the Father except it be by me. So you have to go through the cross to even get to the Father. All of his attributes were on display. Love, mercy, long-suffering, endurance, grace, healer, savior, servant, omnipotent, all of it, reconciled, peacemaker. It's all there. It's at the cross because we look through a different lens, a very different lens. That's why Paul said the mystery has been revealed to us. We don't see it as weakness. We don't see it as gross. We see it as glorious because the greatest man that ever lived hung on an old rugged cross. His name was Jesus. He was fully God and fully man, and he chose to lay his life down that we might have eternal life. It's undeniably God. Look again. Try looking through a different lens. Allow the Holy Spirit to strengthen your lens. You ever had to go to the eye doctor and have them strengthen your glasses a little bit? Don't answer that. Some of you are just looking down. I have recently. Things are starting to get a little blurry. Uh, I had to go get my glasses strengthened. It happens, doesn't it? You can live life and things will get a little blind, blind, and get a little blind or a little blurry or whatever, and you have to strengthen the lens. Here's what the Holy Spirit wants to do for you today. He wants to help you and I see with clarity, clarity, undeniable clarity, what Jesus did for you and I at the cross. You say, well, I'm a believer. Well, if you're a believer, refocus, tighten up the focus because it's all there. And here's the deal. If you, you're going to need him. There's not one person in this room will, that will not need this man who hung on a cross. Everyone in this room, I, it may not be today, but a crisis will come sooner or later. I'll never forget as long as I've been serving the Lord and in ministry. Three years ago, just a, a week or two ago, it hit me on the day. It just hit me like a brick. It was a Sunday service just like this, and I walked out, and my dad called me and said, Hey, Cal, let's, let's go to lunch. Do that all the time. I'd say, okay, and Deb was out of town. I said, jump in the car with me. We talked all the way to Jenkins, and we got to Jenkins and got a table and started talking. In fact, Tommy Willis, of all people, was sitting right there with us. And we were talking and carrying on, and Dad got up and went to the bathroom, and he never made it back to the table. It was in that moment when the reality of that situation hit me. The comforter showed up. The comforter showed up. You, you may not feel like you need him today. You may just be independent enough and have a stiff enough backbone that you're just walking on through your stuff. But I'm telling you, the day will come to every person hearing my voice, whether it's by television or radio or whatever it might be or in this room today, you are going to need him. That's not a fear tactic. That's, I'm not trying to scare you. I'm simply telling you we are all designed to be dependent upon the Savior. Why not today? Why not just give it up and say, oh, God, give me a new lens. Let me see what you are, make available to me and embrace it all. Embrace the suffering. Embrace the victory. Embrace the resurrection. Let it all come alive to you because that's what this is all about. It's more than just a once a year little deal that we do. Every day can be a resurrection. Resurrection Sunday. Every day when the crisis hits or bad news comes or the demotion comes your way, you'll be able to look at that cross and say, blessed be the name of the Lord. You are my provider. I will not fear. I will not succumb. I will not give up because you've got this. You've got me. You've got me all the way back to the cross and you're alive and well and you've got me now. Let's give him praise for that. He's a great God. He's a great God. He's a great God.
What lens are, are you looking through? What lens are you looking through? A resurrection lens or an unbeliever's lens? There's a big difference. There's a big difference. I hope when you look at the cross through the lens of Resurrection Sunday, you'll see a Christ that was on display that has all the answers. He has your life throughout all eternity. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. He's more than just some vain imagination. He's real. I'm telling you, he's real. And he got up from the grave. Would you stand with me, please?